All right. Well, uh, George Reed in the uh, video that we saw that introduced this session uh, said something about, about how the talks were supposed to be uh, both, he was supposed to be a, both a tutorial speaker and a, uh, uh, I forgot the exact word he used, but I think basically provocateur. And uh, I'm going to uh, fulfill both functions, I think, um, in this talk. Uh, I'm going to switch gears quite considerably from what a lot of people have been talking about here and, and discuss uh, global characteristics of alphane waves. Am I doing this right? Yeah, there we go. Seems to be dying. Um, my, my basic point is that in, in, a, in the magnetospheric system, the dynamic coupling of the changes in the electric and magnetic fields and the field line currents are all associated with the propagation of low frequency waves, waves in the ULF wave band. The shear alphane wave is what mediates changes in field line current. The fast mode wave, which I'm going to emphasize quite a bit in this talk, uh, mediates changes in the plasma, in the pressure uh, balance in the plasma. And that's also an important part. So, you know, the idea is, is that, you know, fields do not map. That is not a physical process. That's a mathematical operation that we do to compare electric fields at different altitudes. And they do not penetrate. That's, that's all wrong. I mean, this, I mean it's, it's shorthand for not worrying about the waves, I think, because really the transport of these fields and currents requires the wave propagation. And so that's what I'm going to talk about is some of the modeling we've been doing on that, on that score. Oops, wrong, wrong click. So I'm going to talk, the, the tutorial part is going to be some discussion of resonant cavities and waveguides and ULF frequencies in the magnetosphere, ionosphere, and in the atmosphere. Um, I'll talk about the propagation of shear alphane waves in the ionospheric alphane resonator, which of course was, was very nicely uh, introduced in Ian's talk just before. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the coupling of alphane waves and fast modes. And, and another important take-home message that I'd like to stress in this talk is that is that there's no such thing as a pure MHD wave in the magnetosphere. Because of the inhomogeneities in the system, the modes are always coupled. And, and then I'm going to uh, make some comments on the global propagation of MHD waves between high and mid latitudes. So here's, here's the, I'm going to start at low altitudes and talk about resonant cavities and waveguides. In fact, this figure here is the, is the this is kind of a skitsy uh, pointer. Uh, the, the, this one is the one that Ian showed. The top button. And, uh, and the idea here is this is a, pro a plot of the alphane speed. At the large alphane speed gradients, there's another phrase that George Reed used, an impedance mismatch that can cause reflections of waves. And so the ionospheric alphane resonator is this deep minimum in the alphane speed that occurs uh, in and above the ionosphere. But there's also the fact that below the ionosphere, of course, the plasma basically goes away. And to show that, th here's the lowest 1,000 kilometers of the field line. This one goes up to 10,000 kilometers. And of course, this alphane, the, the effective wave speed goes right up to the speed of light in the atmosphere. And, that's, and then there's an also the, the Earth atmosphere waveguide, uh, Earth ionosphere waveguide, people call it different things, um, that has a fundamental resonance at 8 hertz, which is known as the Schumann resonance. And, and uh, oh, I, I guess I mentioned the alphane IAR as well. That has a characteristic period of a few seconds or or frequencies of, of a fraction of a hertz, and up to about the Schumann resonance uh, point. And, th and this is, this is uh, primarily a theoretical talk, but it's real stuff. Here's some observations from the ground of magnetic pulsations from Finland, uh, uh, showing, showing this sort of irregular ratty band around half a hertz. Here's satellite data from the Viking satellite. This is a, an old slide, as you can tell, and showing something that looks awful lot like a whole bunch of, of resonant modes in some kind of a cavity. And I think this is the sort of the typical, the typical uh, uh, only case ever seen uh, example of that. Um, here's another example from ground magnetometer data from the uh, uh, Lester group. And, and this, this is one of, the, one of the best ones I've seen so far. They've seen all sorts of, of uh, harmonics of this resonance. And the one thing you can see, I hope, is that as you go, and of course this is for, again from Finland, so UT is within a few hours of MLT and you can see as you go away from noon, these frequencies go up. That's consistent with the fact that these, these, uh, wave, the frequency of these waves scales inversely with the scale height of the ionosphere. So you'd have higher frequencies at night than you, than you would during the day. And we actually did some modeling of this uh, by, by calculating the transmission coefficient of waves through the ionosphere to the ground. And, and uh, without too much twiddling of parameters, we got, got pretty decent 
agreement even to the frequencies of, of, these, of these guys. So that's kind of an interesting point. Another thing you'll see here, and I'll come back to this later, is that, is that things start to wash out at higher frequencies, which is not reproduced in our model, and I'll tell you why that is later. So here's just an ex example of, of the uh, ionospheric alphane resonator. I'll show you a, a little simulation here. Here's, here's a very weak gradient in the density. Again, this is about 60 kilometers along the field line and up to 4RE. So, so it's just a, a broadband sort of a, a gradient, and the alphane speed gets bigger on the right-hand side than on the left-hand side. And I'll show you a, a, a simulation where we take a uniform pulse on the top of the system at 1 hertz and allow it to propagate through the system. And you can see, of course, on that right-hand side where things are faster, it came down more quickly. This is continual driving at a hertz. This phase mixing process that I just talked about in, in response to Ian's talk, you can see causing this smaller scale structure. And I really like this plot because you can see all of these different harmonic modes of the ionospheric alphane resonator uh, coming out. So this is a, a really, this is, this, is a, it's, this is a very unrealistic sort of simulation, just sort of something set up to, to help understanding. Now, fat, we, you know, we've concentrated on the shear wave in the IAR, but the fast mode waves can also be trapped in the IAR, but they can propagate along across magnetic field lines. The fast mode wave propagates isotropically, so those waves can, they're, they're not just trapped at a single frequency, they can propagate horizontally, basically, and they have a dispersion relation, which is calculated here. This is for a high conductivity case and a low conductivity case, and if you take the slope of these, this is a omega versus k curve, standard dispersion relation. You see these have group velocities of about 1,000 or a couple thousand kilometers per second. So these sorts of waves can propagate along field lines. And the important point is that these waves couple to the shear alphane wave by Hall conductivity. Now, I want to make maybe one of my first provocative uh, comments here is that uh, many models that we've seen already today uh, and yesterday have assumed this electrostatic boundary condition which, uh, uh, which relies on current continu continuity to model the ionosphere. But if I want to model both the shear wave and the fast wave, this is not adequate because the fast wave does not carry a field aligned current. So it doesn't show up in that type of model. And more generally, what you should do is, is look at, if you think of the ionosphere as a sheet, and I'll relax that assumption later on in the talk, uh, and just do your old Jackson problem, where, the, where you integrate uh, Ampere's law around a loop and you get this uh, term involving a change of B across the loop and then here's the uh, current, sigma of course is the conduct, uh, conductance tensor. Uh, you get a, a generalized boundary condition. If you take the divergence of this term, just, just ideally assuming the uh, conductances are constant, you recover the current continuity equation, but you also get this other equation that comes in and the thing to notice is that the divergence of E corresponds to the shear wave, the curl of E corresponds to the fast mode wave, and you can see from these two equations that it's the Hall conductance that, that uh, couples those two modes. And so, and so this, is, this is an idea that, that uh, uh, you know, these, the, you should be careful about these current continuity co equations. They might not always be true. Um, going down into the atmosphere, as I mentioned, there's a, a cavity mode in there called the, the Schumann resonance. Now, in, uh, in electrical engineering terms, people talk about TE and TM modes. Uh, the TE mode, it turns out, has, has a, a, is, is basically the mode trapped between the, the uh, uh, Earth and the ionosphere. So its fundamental frequency is the speed of light divided by the height of the atmosphere until you get to the ionosphere, which is, which is up in the VLF range. So for ULF, that's not important. So you have only these TM modes that can propagate. And in principle, you might think those can go down to zero, but if you just take, if you take a, a consider a frequency, a wave that's, that's got a wavelength of the circumference of the Earth, and you calculate that, that's about 7.5 hertz, which is a pretty good approximation for the fundamental Schumann resonance at 8 hertz. Now, now here's one of the things that I think is uh, uh, perhaps controversial to some people. Now, uh, Kikuchi and Araki, a while ago, suggested that mo modes in this, in this uh, Earth ionosphere waveguide can propagate energy at the speed of light from high to low altitude, latitudes, and they were trying to explain the very quick response of the preliminary reverse impulse at the onset of storms. And this was disputed by Peter Chi a number of years later, who suggested that fast mode waves converting to the shear mode can explain 
the PRI, and I'm, I'm uh, in the uh, camp of Peter Chi in this, in this, in this particular case. Anyway, this is, this is actually in Jackson's textbook on E&M uh, in the resonant cavities and waveguide chapters that most of you probably skipped when you were taking that course because most people don't like to teach it. If you take it from me, you get that chapter. Uh, then, uh, but you see this, this 8 hertz, this nice 8 hertz uh, uh, frequency for the Schumann resonance. All right, getting to the, to the modeling then, uh, our recent model, we've included a dipole model, includes a full ionosphere. This is just a linear wave model, so it's nowhere near as sophisticated as, as the global MHD, but we do have the advantage that we can go all the way down to the ground, and uh, all the way down to the ionosphere, and in fact, in principle, we can get all the way down to the ground and model the whole system. And in, uh, the other point is, is as uh, in contrast to a lot of the previous models, we have a, a distributed Pedersen, Hall, and parallel conductivities uh, within the bulk of the simulation here as we go, go along here. So, so we, we're getting beyond just the sheet ionosphere approximation that people use. Uh, one way to test this is just to turn on a current and see what happens. And what happens is that you get a ringing effect. And this ringing occurs, uh, let's see, the, these are, uh, I, I forget what the two different curves are. So, uh, sorry about that. Oh, this is E, X, and B, Y. Uh, so you see it in both fields. If you Fourier transform this signal, you get a, a number of frequencies, and those are exactly the frequencies you'd expect for the IIR. And if you, if you now drive the system at those frequencies, you see in the electric field and in the magnetic field, you get this nice sort of resonant structure uh, like you saw in the simulation with, with one, two, and three bumps uh, in the low altitude region there. If you include the Hall conductivity and this, and this uh, more generalized boundary condition, you see that, that uh, uh, these modes, the lowest mode actually doesn't really do much. It just kind of decays away. And that's because that's at the cutoff uh, of those dispersion relations I showed earlier. But the higher harmonics can propagate along the field line. And one of the things that's curious and we don't quite understand is there often seems to be a predisposition for it to propagate either poleward or equatorward or in the 3D model, eastward or westward. And that seems to be a sensitive function of the Hall to Pedersen conductivity ratio. Another thing that you get by looking at a, a, uh, a full ionosphere is something that's, that's also well known, or at least should be well known, and that is that at high frequencies, the ionosphere shields signals uh, from, from lower altitudes. And this is just basically the collisionless skin depth that you can read about in another chapter of Jackson, and uh, the one where he talks about conductors. And, uh, and what we did to test that is we drove, we drove the system with just a, a broadband spectrum with lots of different waves, uh, with, with equal amplitude, amplitudes and random phases. We get a lot of noise, but if you sort of smooth out that, that, uh, all, all those wiggles, you can see, again, a number of, of modes propagating up here. Again, the IR modes. And then you get this sharp cutoff, in this case, at about 1.3 hertz. And so this shows you that ionospheric shielding effect that you get by using the, the uh, a full ionosphere structure. Well, let's move out now to... How, how am I doing on time here? Am I okay? All right, so uh, if, we're, if we move out to uh, the more global structures now and looking at, at uh, uh, actually lower frequency waves, there's a number of, of resonances and cavities that have been talked about. Uh, probably the most famous are the field line resonances, and, and here's, here's an example from a paper by Takahashi and, and Brian Anderson showing, showing a number of frequencies as a function of L-shell. You can see that the frequencies jump up when you hit the plasma pause because the density goes down and the alphane speed goes up at those regions. Um, I, somebody, I forget who, showed, showed a picture somewhat like this yesterday, I believe. Uh, and so, so these are the, the, the things that are, can be used to diagnose the mass density in the magnetosphere. Um, another thing that comes about, which I'll also address, are plasma spheric cavity modes. And Dong Hun Lee, who has uh, uh, actually done a lot of work with me on this stuff before, um, has, has touted this as, as a possible mechanism for, for affecting the frequencies of PI2s. And, and so there's that kind of mode. There's also more glo there are a couple things that are, are a little bit, uh, uh, have been some trouble observing. And these are the global cavity modes that Margie Kivelson has talked about a lot. And, and, and the, it, these seem to be kind of hard to, to observe, and maybe she can correct me if there's better observations of this uh, later. And another thing that, that John Sampson uh, focused on, and Andy Wright as well, is you can think of waves propagating down the tail as a waveguide. So I'm, I'm going to concentrate on these first two uh, rather than on the last two. And to do that, we're going to use a, it's basically the same model, but now we're going from one ionosphere to the other. 
and we go from our inner boundary here is at L equal 1.5, and the outer boundary is at L equals 10, and we put a plasma sphere at, at, uh, with a plasma pause at L equals 4 based on the, the uh, profiles that Rick Chappell, of Rick Chappell a long time ago that we actually saw on a slide yesterday. And, uh, and, and so we look at this sort of model, and then, again, what I do in this sort of, of uh, a run is I drive the outer, outer side of the system with a compressional wave pulse, and, and here, we're t here we're, one of the places we're focusing on here is this sort of PI12 because the Alberta group has, uh, has shown, done some nice work showing that waves sort of in this range, the boundary between these is 40 second period. And as they, as they point out in their papers, there's no real difference between you know, uh, uh, 39 second waves and 51 second waves. Uh, uh, you know, 40 seconds is just an arbitrary number. And so what we've done is we're, we're going to use 50 seconds as a nice number and drive these systems. And again, now on this side is, is, is what I call BZ, the compressional mode, uh, compressional component of the magnetic field. And here's EX, the shear component, uh, component of the shear alphane wave. Here comes the compressional wave in, and it bounces around. You can see this nice little, little uh, uh, mode coming in in the plasmasphere. And over here, you see very nicely, I'll run this one again, uh, if I can find it, uh, you can see the development of these uh, field aligned structures. This is the mode conversion that takes place between the fast mode and the shear mode. And if you look at it, there's sort of a, there's actually two fundamentals in here. One, one that's kind of in here, one that's right sort of at the plasma pause. And here you can actually see an evidence of a third harmonic coming in. And that actually con is consistent with the, with the pictures that we have. And I, I'll, I'll skip that, that one just because it just explains what I already said. Um, another thing to do just for fun, of course, we don't, we don't want to do everything so nice and symmetrically. So, so here's one, you know, we put the source at 15 degrees, which I picked for a typical angle of a dipole offset if, you, if, you're, if you're hitting it from the uh, magneto tail. And you, know, you, get, you get these things kind of sloshing around. These are, these are fun to look at. Uh, and again, you get these field line resonance structures coming out and, and you, you can... Uh, uh, one, one point I make here for ULF wave people is that you don't always see a nice clear node at the equator like, uh, like people uh, like to see, although it kind of looks all right there. But uh, you can see that this, this uh, stuff works out. Now, coming back to the Kikuchi and Araki story, if you look at this compressional mode here, uh, and, and you notice this time scale here, this whole run is 200 seconds. And so, so this, this compressional signal comes in and, and basically propagates all along at in the inner edge of our system in, in, in a few seconds. And so, you know, I'm not quite sure how, how fast a, prompt, a preliminary reverse, reverse impulse is or how, how prompt a prompt penetration electric field comes in, but, but you know, this is, this is pretty fast. And, uh, you know, so, you know, within certainly less than a minute, the, the, the fast mode waves can communicate from pole to equator uh, very easily without having to invoke the uh, the atmospheric waveguide modes. So here's a few conclusions, uh, most of which are the things that I've said already. And that, and that is, and the, the, the big bottom line is that this system is inhomogeneous. Uh, modes are all coupled, uh, basically. You can't really always talk about a pure alf shear alphane wave mode or a pure fast mode wave. Certainly in some limits, uh, you have good approximations. And there's all these different cavities and waveguides. The IAR is an important point. Um, again, the electrostatic boundary condition, you should, you know, I mean, sometimes it's probably okay. Certainly in an in a actual static case, it would be okay, but, but, uh, but not, not all the time. And uh, again, fast mode perturbations coupled to the shear, uh, shear mode field line resonances, which is something that's been known for a long time. And uh, uh, these simulations are, are some nice examples of that to illustrate all of that. And one, one important point that I'd like to stress is that ULF wave propagation is fast. I mean, those whole runs, those whole runs I was showing were tw 200 seconds or uh, with three or four minutes. And so, so, you know, on the time scale that most people have been talking about here, all this stuff is happening virtually instantaneously, and it's these sorts of things that are, are causing the, uh, uh, are the dynamics behind these changes that take place in the magnetosphere. Now, just because it says conclusions doesn't mean it's the last slide. Um, <laughs> uh, there's, there's a lot of future work here, and, and of course, uh, there seems to be a lot of talk about editorship going along, and of course, I'm the one that should buy, buy Mike a beer, actually, and Larry Kepko, for that matter, uh, who's, who's also one of the new editors.
But no, I'm, I'm planning on having lots of free time now, and uh, so I've got a lot of ideas for future work. We have developed a three-dimensional model, and I actually have some results if, if uh, there's no questions. Um, but the, but the uh, present, I'm sure you have lots of questions. The present model has, has, is, is it's three-dimensional for the wave fields, but all the background parameters are, are axisymmetric, which of course is, is absurd. Um, we have, actually Colin Waters has, has developed a code to, to uh, uh, structure an atmosphere using MSIS and IRI as a function of latitude and local time. Uh, but we haven't, that's one of the first things I'll be doing this spring is to integrating this in, into this wave model. And of course, that'll include day-night uh, asymmetries. We have actually also do already done some runs with north-south asymmetries, uh, which give you an interesting thing called quarter wave modes. Um, the, the ionospheric feedback that Ian Cohen talked about in the previous talk is not yet included. Parallel electric fields can be included. And, and these are things that we know how to do, and it's just the work of doing it. Uh, the plasma sphere uh, structure, of course, is not just uh, uh, spherically uh, or, uh, cylindrically symmetric. There's all this nice dondex asymmetry and plumes, and we have, I didn't, I didn't uh, print out the adjective that Jerry used to describe his model, but, uh, but you know, a simple model like that could be very useful in, in showing us, in, in, you know, giving us some background parameters to, to uh, run with. Finite pressure and self, these things are all relatively easy, Finite pressure and self-consistent magnetic field is tougher. Um, this model is in non-orthogonal coordinates. There's all sorts of wonderful math behind it that I love, but I'm sure most of you don't care about. Uh, making the magnetic field realistic so that there's a tail on a compressed uh, day side requires uh, changing, uh, making them a more complicated metric tensor. But we've also played around with that. And then the final thing that, that we... Uh, are interested in doing is this is basically the same sort of, of simulation model that people use when they talk about Schumann resonances. We've actually talked with Jamasina Simpson at University of Utah who does some of that. And, and if we can get a model that includes both the magnetospheric and the fast mode waves and this atmospheric waveguide stuff, we can really make a, a test of, of Kikuchi's hypothesis. So that is my last slide. Thank you. Um, with regard to the inductive versus electrostatic ionosphere, I, I, I remember doing an analysis one time to try and determine when we could get away with the electrostatic ionosphere. And uh, it seems to me that it's around 10 seconds. In other words, if you have time, time scale for variations faster than 10 seconds, chances are the ionosphere is starting to, to evolve <laughs> inductively. It depends to some extent on the pe Hall to Pedersen conductance ratio. Exactly. I I just want to see if you agree with that because, uh, you know, it, it, it is a common thing to use in the global simulations. Right. I mean, it, 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 is, it is basic. It is, it is, for one thing, dependent on Hall to Pedersen ratio. That's an important, an important point. And, and you, are, you are also right that, it, that it's sort of, sort of around, well, maybe I'd say maybe stretch it a little bit, tens of seconds. Um, but another aspect of it that's a little, little subtle is that, is that uh, Aki Yoshikawa has shown that, that the you know, the singularity you often get in, in the, uh, in, you know, uh, theories of the field line resonance gets resolved if you include the inductive ionosphere as the boundary condition as well. So, and those are at, at longer periods. So there are some, some other cases in which uh, it could be important to do that. Well, you invited a comment uh, on a global mode. There, uh, Mike Cartinger has used Themis data and has found, yes, it's very hard to identify global modes, but he has some pretty v convincing cases, mainly near the noon local time sector. Very nice talk. Are, 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 those, are those published? I think so. You, you, they're, they're Excuse? Don't you think I read all those papers? 